Hi there. Mm. Okay, so it's um, just after nine on um, Sunday night. Um, I had this grand, grand plan to use this very clever technology called StreamYard. Uh, but I could only get it to really work properly on my Facebook art page. So I am um, had to, at the last minute, um, consult my technical team. Uh, this is my technical team over here. Um, yeah, and, you know, as you can see, he fell asleep on the job. So he's of actually of no use. So I thought um, we'll have to just go back to the old-fashioned way. And, um, yeah. So, you know, it's uh, this must be about the 15th, close to the 15th one that I've now, maybe not quite as many as those. Uh, and I, I have to say, it's been a fascinating, you know, and the, the to use the overused word journey, because when I first started doing it, I just felt compelled to, um, you know, to be, I think at, the st at that stage, it was essentially to be a... Um, something that existed between the laboratories between what the scientists do because i'm no longer a practicing scientist but i was for quite some time and between and and the media uh, just to be kind of a voice and i and and it's it's really a valuable thing to have the distance of not being at the coalface of 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 science and and especially in this current situation because i i i think it'd be very difficult um now i've just done something here uh yeah, I think it would be very difficult to actually navigate this if you are an actual practicing scientist. So I thought that uh, I felt compelled to do that, and and as time's gone by, I've really started to find this quite a, re a, a an interesting way to not just explore and dis and talk about people's um, uncertainties around um, the this virus outbreak, but almost more importantly to talk about. Um, you know, the nature of that, but also the nature of science and where it sits in our society and where it sits with me, I, I, it's, which is, you know, because I, I've realized um, that a big part of this has got to do with my need to tap into who I, who I was and, and wh who I am now as a scientist, as an artist. And, uh, you know, I've just, I've just seen this as now part of what that story is. But, um, so, you know, I had some slides I wanted to share, and I'll still share them, but they're going to have to be done in this sort of primitive way of, of, of looking at the, uh, just basically pointing the camera at the screen. Real tech, tech savvy. Um, but tonight, so what I want to talk to you, uh, to you about tonight is um, I definitely wanted to, I really enjoyed the last session I did because what I tried to do there was bring uh, the context you know, this really important word for me is the context of where science fits in our world. You know, we thrown a lot of facts, a lot of ideas, um, but knowing actually where they fit in our human experience is, I think, really interesting and 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 helps also give us some um, a better sense and a better maybe appreciation of of what science is and and. It's it's a place as a as a as a as one of the ways that human beings try to find meaning in their world. Um, so that is that is something I I I think worked really well, uh, and I want to continue to do that. So um, you know, this takes me to to a place in our history, let's say, where you know. Hard to know exactly how far back we go, but you know there was a time before before science really got going, where you know most of my experience of the world came through, um, you know, religion um, and 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 you know we've always just been wanting to find patterns, and around the seventeen hundreds and eighteen hundreds there were great advancements, and and those advancements essentially made us feel that we had control over nature. So for example, uh, Watts, you know, inventing the steam engine, uh, Edward Jenner inventing vaccination, um, you know, other profound, profound events uh, that led to our great success as an industrial nation, uh, 
penicillin uh, around the early part of the 20th century made us feel that we were really somehow absolved from having to deal with nature. It, it was no longer of concern to us. And, and you know, we've been hearing sort of utterings and mutterings over the last 30, 40 years that our overuse of antibiotics is going to cause us trouble. You know, we're certainly seeing um, with, with climate change that our weather is starting to sort of feel a little unmanageable at times. And, and, and I, but, but having said that, I, I, I never, I, I, you know, as someone who actually works in the, sci in the sciences or have had worked in the sciences, I felt, uh, and, and not consciously, because intellectually, and this is, I think, an important distinction, intellectually um, or, or subconsciously, I didn't think that we could be, uh, you know, subservient to nature. Because I think our history has taught us that. And, and our, um, our uh, what's the word, our commandeering. And I, that's a strong word, but that's what it is. That's what we felt we'd, we'd done. We felt like we had really nailed the mechanization, the understanding the mechanisms of nature and harnessing those mechanisms of nature. So we were no longer subject to it. We had finally controlled it. And, you know, um, I think that's why this pandemic has been so unsettling, because it's reminded us that we are very much a part of nature. We, are, we cannot separate ourselves from it. And then actually, uh, I've been reading this book. I found this beautiful, well, actually, a friend of mine lent me this beautiful book. And, and my plan, I hope he's not listening, is, 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 to, is to hang on to it for so long that he forgets that he lent it to me. And then I can have it because it's a beautiful book. Um, but what it is, I'll just, I'll just show it to you. Um, I'm going to turn the camera around now. Um, the invention, the book's called The Invention of Nature. It's the story, biography of Alexander von Humboldt. Okay. Uh, now, in this, in this book, you know, he talks about um, this, this idea that science had really had a strong domination of, over nature because we'd invented these instruments we could now measure we must observe and this is now giving us all we have to do is measure nature and we can literally understand it fully and it can no longer be something that is foreign to us or a mystery and that sense of god's wrath for example benjamin franklin's uh harnessing of lightning through experimentation showed uh that we had some kind of control over nature but he, you know, he was a, a bit of an interesting character and he's thought that's all good and well having these instruments to measure nature and to sort of control it. But if we lose that appreciation, that sense of wonder um, and that love, that love of being in nature and respecting it and understanding that we're just part of it, you know, ultimately we're going to lose something. And, that, and that's a, that's a, I think... A, a, a really important way in which not only scientists but also our culture we need to think about nature when we're dealing with things like even this pandemic we need to spin all of it and and I use the word all um, I don't use it lightly because it's 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 a big word even though it's only three letters but it it is we need to have this incredible sense of awe so that we can be amazed by it and and, and I'm going to try and talk about a couple of things which are amazing about us being human and us being a part of nature. So, you know, that's Alexander von Humboldt. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely um, passage in the book where, uh, this is a sketch I did about this passage where, you know, he was an avid experimenter and he um, was doing experiments with frogs' legs uh, where they would, you know, dis, uh, take a frog's leg and try and... Um, get an electric current to go through it because they used to think there was this thing called animal electricity and he breathed on it and he got a huge shock. Well, he didn't, but it, essentially this frog leg jumped across the table because the moisture from his mouth uh, essentially had uh, caused the conductivity to get massive in that instant. And the reason I'm showing you this is because it was kind of in that moment uh, that it it was a great symbol of the birth of the thing that's now called the life sciences. 
you know, where we now through experimentation and through our engagement with nature, try and understand the natural world. So this was, he was one of the founding figures of that. But more importantly, uh, before, before um, uh, Humboldt came along, you know, with the likes of Isaac Newton and Descartes, Rene Descartes, it was really believed that the world and all the animals and living things and the universe itself was just a big, exquisite machine. And living things, animals, whatever they were, were just actually small kinds of machines. Um, and that's how they worked. We just had to figure out the clockwork of these things, and we've seen how clocks work, so we can now really figure out how the universe works. But what I think what Humboldt's great contribution was to science and also to our appreciation of our place in the natural world is that he spoke about um, not a machine, but rather a world, let me find a pointing device, where things interacted. So in a machine, you should be able to take it apart. Let's do the bicycle here, take it apart. There's the bits of the bicycle, and you should be able to just simply put it back together and the machine or bicycle is gonna work again. The same thing is not going to do be the case with a rabbit because a rabbit is made up of lots of interacting bits. Every part influences every other part. So if you took apart your rabbit in this rather macabre experiment, which thankfully I don't think he did do, you can't put it back together again. It's a lot more interesting and complicated and, and, inter, and interactive than that. And, and yes, that is, I think, a really interesting way of even thinking about this pandemic that we're living in. Yes, it's a terrible thing. We want to get rid of it. But we need to ask ourselves, how does it fit into our natural world? How do we fit in? What have we done that's made it sort of be part of our world? And should we be fighting it? Is it a war that we should be having with this virus? Or should we be really reflecting on, on what it's doing to us and our society and just us as a species? It's a more interesting question than just combating it and coming up with vaccines, which obviously is important, but it also is telling us another story. So that's something I'd, I'd like to share. Now, something else I just came across this morning. Um, have a look at this picture. Now, this is not a picture of a virus. What this is actually is um, John Coltrane. All right, now he's the famous jazz musician. Why am I talking about famous jazz musicians in a talk about viruses? A, in specifically, a talk about SARS-CoV-2. Why? What is, besides the fact that it looks ever so slightly like a virus, what John Contro Coltrane believed, um, I think, I think one can infer from this, is what a lot of scientists believe and what a lot of, I think, what we believe, a lot of people believe, is that beneath everything, at, at the heart of the mystery of the universe, is a pattern, is essentially perfection, some sort of perfect equation, some sort of um, symmetry that completely is at the heart and cornerstone of our universe. Um, John Coltrane, with that belief, made beautiful music, um, Scientists have done extraordinary work, having that in the back of their minds as it drives them to it. That idea came from Plato. Plato believed that the world and everything in it was a poor, a very, very poor reflection of this ultimate truth and beauty beneath everything. And that all we are trying to do is get back to that truth. But in the realization, in the messy world we live in, it's probably never going to happen. So that is kind of what I infer from, um, from, from, from even down to this musician, this extraordinary musician, John Coltrane, you know, he believed as well that there was a, a symmetry, a profound beauty underlying everything, and he could express some kind of simulacrum of that. It, it helped me actually understand even my own work as an artist. Um, this drawing here, um, which is called... Uh, we, we sat in motion with the birds. I, I show you this because I have come to realize I'm exploring some kind of tension. You can see these very strong geometrical lines uh, coming through in the work. But 
I'm conf- not confused, but I don't seem to be convinced of that because within the work are birds and other chaotic like lines and wiry things interacting with this perfection. Or maybe it's saying we, over, we are clouding this perfection um, with, you know, with, with, with life, with, with who we are, or that there is no such perfection underneath it all. I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think what's important is to recognize that we are informed. The way we see the world now is informed by these profound ideas. Now, that's Plato. That is the ideal and perfect world of maths and, 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 and music and beauty. But the world of viruses, the world of biology, is actually, uh, I would go so far as to say, more influenced by philosophers like, uh, I hope I don't get his, uh, I think Socrates, who believed, I think it was Socrates, and I, I often get it wrong, it could be, um, but he countered um, Plato, and, and he believed, like, as I mentioned previously, that things need to be measured, observed. The only real way you're going to get to truth is through observation. And most likely, and what we've come to realize in science, you can never really get to what this thing is called the truth. All you can ever do is march along a path towards reducing the uncertainty of how we understand our world. Um, the, the, uh, the study of viruses is completely like that. It's an empirical science. You go into the world, you try and isolate these things called viruses, and you try and study what they do. You try and look at their genetic material to understand what they are. Now, this brings to me to uh, what I think is the discovery of the actual coronaviruses. Not this current one that we're looking at and facing right now, but actually the whole group of coronaviruses were only really discovered in the 1960s. And, and there's a really interesting story that, that, that goes behind it. In England, as a post, in, during the post-war period of the 50s and 60s, uh, Harvard University donated a um, hospital. Uh, it was a hospital used in the, in the war, during the war. They gave it to the, the, the British Medical Research Council. They said, yeah, you can do what you want with this. They turned it into what was, has become known as the Common Cold Research Unit. All right, the Common Cold Research Unit. I show you a little picture of that. This is a still from some videos you can actually find. The, reason, the way I came across this is I was scrolling through some of the literature on coronaviruses and this name Tyrrell kept coming up. And, and it's a fascinating thing and it tells you a lot about the kinds of research that they were doing in the 60s that you actually, I don't think you are, that we can even really do now. I don't think it would be considered and I stand under correction here, but when I read about this place, I thought it was quite uh, intriguingly macabre, yet surprisingly fruitful. So, so what the cold research group or cold research unit is, is a place in England, in Salisbury, where people used to go for a holiday. A lot of them enjoy, called it a holiday. This, this, is, this is a very cute photograph of a woman, and what she's saying is, and she's British, but she says, yes, it's my third visit. It's a very relaxing holiday. The countryside is beautiful. Now, what they did there is they would go there and they would literally allow themselves. You should actually go to YouTube and look it up, Cold Research Unit. They would go there and get cold virus injected in their nose and show that if you did that, you would catch a cold. And then they would do all sorts of experiments on humans, because they are humans, uh, showing that if you removed, after you have cold-like symptoms, if you removed the um, snot uh, from the nose and cleaned it up a little bit uh, and put it up somebody else's nose, that person would catch a cold, all right? So, so it, it's an, ex- an extraordinary um, um, idea that, that, that this kind of research was done I don't think it's common now, and I don't, I'm not sure if it, this place is, has subsequently, they ran out of funding, but, you know, uh, some of the scientists felt, and I think rightfully, that it's, it's an incredible way to learn about viruses. Then they would try and characterize these different viruses. Um, the kind of work they would do, so very simply, um, they would take um, mucus from one person who has a cold 
and stick it straight up the nose of another person who doesn't have a cold and show that it has a cold. Now, one of the issues you've actually got with viruses is when you isolate a new virus, first of all, it's not trivial to isolate a virus you, because they're hard to grow. You have to find the only way you can grow a virus is in a cell, all right? Now, you have to have the right cell for the virus to grow in. Those can be very hard to come by. What invariably happens is that you land up only studying a few kinds of viruses because most of the other ones you can't really grow properly. So those become real issues. So what they did at this group is they showed that you could transmit the virus from one person's nose to another person's nose, but that doesn't really help you characterize the virus. The next thing they did was they showed that you could take these viruses out of the nose, put it in some kinds of cells, and what would happen is if you left it there for a few days, the virus would start increasing in these test tubes with the cells, and eventually the cells would disappear and you'd be left with only virus. That is a critical moment. Anyone who's researching a virus gets terribly excited when they got a new virus and they can get that to happen because that means they've been able to grow this culture, this virus in a cell culture. That's really critical. And then what they do is what's called Koch postulate. Now, that was at the time when to understand the germ theory of disease, the way that uh, you characterize a disease, an infectious disease, is you have to show that you can isolate the disease in some kind of pure form, separate it from the host, and be able to grow it away from the host, and then take it and put it into a new host and show that that host develops the disease only as a result of that infectious agent. That was a very important milestone in understanding disease and, and the fact that disease can be caused by infectious agents. You first have to separate the infectious agent from the host, otherwise you're not really proving anything. Okay, that's called Koch's postulate. And this was done at, uh, you know, it's been done for many different viruses, but it was very curious that this is how they discovered the first human coronaviruses by actually using at this place in Salisbury in the UK. And what they realized is that there are so many different coronaviruses, not just coronaviruses, but there are also lots of different viruses that cause colds. Now it's interesting that, and we know now that these coronaviruses cause colds and they've probably been circulating in our populations for thousands of years. What we now have is a brand new coronavirus that is not yet adapted to us and causes significantly greater disease. But most of them we tolerate and we don't even really care about. They never really managed to get vaccines for these cold viruses because it actually was too hard to know what was, what was causing the cold. It was too difficult. Uh, it could have been a coronavirus. It could have been many other kinds of viruses. So that research never led to, uh, to vaccines because it was just too difficult and cumbersome and not really worth it to invest all of that effort. And I think they lost interest, or at least the funding people lost interest in funding this facility. So it closed down. So yeah, that's, uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting story about um, how these early coronaviruses were actually discovered in the first place. I'll just show you quickly. This is the first image, the first image of a human coronavirus, electron micrograph. So just take a good look at that. There you can even see just like our coronavirus today, the uh, SARS coronavirus, there's the, uh, that's where the nucleic acid, the genetic material is contained. There is the, um, the capsid and protruding from the surface. These are those famous, now quite famous, I think even our kindergarten children can say the word spike proteins, right? They're the ones that are really critical for the disease. Right, so that is it for how we found these coronaviruses. Um, now, I want to tell you something else. Uh, you know, we're jumping around a little bit here, and I hope you don't mind. Um, please feel free to throw a question on the line. But, you know, experimentation, the way that we've worked, we can't predict these things theoretically like, like they do in uh, physics or maths. It's everything done and every discovery, everything we understand about viruses is essentially come by through experimentation, through actually going into the lab, doing experiments, analyzing the proteins that viruses make, analyzing the way that the virus interacts with human host cells, analyzing the antibody response, letting the results of those experiments 
generate more questions for us to answer and ask. That is, the, that is the beauty of good science, is when you allow the story that's unfolding in your, through your experiments to inform your next lot of experiments. If you allow that process to happen, and it takes a while, it take, can take years and years and years, what you will land up with is a, a story of the virus, and you'll a greater understanding, less uncertainty, but these things do take time. Now, just to talk a little bit about how wily, how extraordinary, extraordinarily um, adaptive viruses are and how very much like an arms race it is between the host, us, and the virus. So um, there's an example of um, some coronaviruses are stopped. They, they cannot enter a cell because the, vi the host produces a certain kind of protein, um, which is, I think it's from the, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what protein it is, but essentially there are a lot of proteins that the, the host will produce and stick on the surface of its cell, which stop the virus from coming in, all right? Literally, and the analogy be like, uh, if you're at a fortress and there are um, cannons on the surface, and these cannons uh, stop the virus from coming in by shooting it. Let's just think, see them as invaders, right? Now, some viruses, very close relatives of the ones that cannot get into that cell because of these very clever protein cannons, let's call them, they recognize those protein cannons and they actually use those very same proteins that the cell uses to stop the virus from coming in. They get onto those proteins and they use those proteins which are sticking out on the surface to get into the cell. Can you see how wily and how fascinating virus evolution must be for it to allow that kind of um, uh, mechanism of getting around the, the host? It's a little bit not too dissimilar from HIV's mechanism. So the immune system's all there to stop a virus from entering the cell uh, and to stop a virus infection, but some viruses have capitalized on the presence of the immune response and used it to get in, to, to, to help them infect cells. So the story is really complex and interesting, and, and that's why it needs a lot of time, a lot of, because um, you can't predict that. That you've got to discover. So it's really important that those things are accommodated during the scientific process. Right. So that really gets me to um, pretty much what I wanted to say. The last thing I did want to say was um, somebody asked me a question about this um, immunity. All right. Now, um, that's quite current and topical at the moment because, you know, there's a lot of data out there which is suggesting that um, there is a, you know, people in the community are... There's quite a lot of what they call zero positivity. Okay, fairly large proportions of a population, depending very much on which population are, you're looking at, uh, present uh, are positive. They give positive responses for antibodies. In other words, they produce antibodies to the virus. Uh, the concern is that people are using that as an argument to say, well, these people, therefore, if they have the antibodies, they've been exposed to the virus, they've been infected. They may not have gotten sick, but they've been infected and we should be able, those people should be safe. Now, based on what I've previously said, it takes a long time to really know what this means. Yes, a lot of viruses, it is the case, if there's been previous exposures, you will have uh, immunity. But it is too early for us to know what these results really mean. And what I mean by that is, a, I spoke about this the other day. Some of their studies have grossly overestimated the prevalence um, in the in the hurry and understandable hurry to get the data out. Uh, concerning it's the media that's rushed the stuff, and some of these scientists have gone to the media before going to uh, get their work peer reviewed, which would be the much healthier approach. So we don't know what it means that they are seropositive. Does that mean they've been infected? Because another thing that's not really been considered very much, and I think it is an issue, is for a proper infection, for an infection that makes you sick, it can be possibly the dose of the virus that has been taken in uh, through inhalation or whatever means 
has to be quite high. It has to be a certain dose. Uh, it must be an optimal dose that has to be... That dose is not known. It's not known in the laboratory. Nobody has studied how much virus does it take to have an inf effective, effective infection, which is a concern. So we are seeing a lot of seropositivity. In other words, there's been a lot of exposure, probably, but we don't know what that exposure means. Is that exposure to low doses of the virus? Is it exposure to little bits of the virus that's floating out? There? More, I would say that's quite unlikely. Um, but we don't know the sensitivity. We don't know how well or how subtle uh, the tests are that are picking up the virus antibodies. So there's too much that is currently unknown there. The other really important thing we don't know is, yes, we have antibodies, but we don't know what kind of antibodies they are. So that's a different kind of test. The basic, very simple serology test that's out there doesn't tell us that. It tells us that there generally are antibodies, yes, but the antibodies we are most concerned about are these ones down here. Do they have antibodies that actually neutralize the virus? Okay. We also, and this, we also don't know that even if it does have antibodies that neutralize the virus, does that stop subsequent infections? Because people think, and, and uh, even a very famous um, immunologist here in Australia, uh, I think he's a Nobel Prize winning uh, immunologist, Neil Fraser, um, has suggested uh, that this virus is a mucosal virus. It, 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 it's on the epidermis, on the inside of the skin. You know, when I say inside, you inhale it, the surface of your trachea and all that, all down to the lungs, is a surface. It's not really inside the body. How much, how exposed the interior of the body is this? Again, that is not known. The only thing that's a bit encouraging is a preprint pre -print that came out not too long ago which is, they used monkeys, all right? They took a rhesus macaque monkey and they showed that rhesus macaque monkeys, uh, if you infect them with a virus and they clear the virus and then you reinfect them, the virus doesn't make, doesn't manage to elicit another infection, all right? That's encouraging results, but this is done over a month ago. It hasn't been published officially yet, I don't think. And very importantly, in the methods, uh, they've only done this on four monkeys. Four monkeys doesn't sound like a lot of monkeys to me. Uh, if you're the monkey, uh, yes, it would seem like you've done it on enough monkeys, but it's actually not sufficient. Uh, you probably need to have a larger population if you're going to be making claims like that. So I think that would be the sort of reason why this has maybe not yet been published in a fully-fledged form. So yes, it's early days, again, of even knowing the results to that. One would I would suggest, uh, and I think, you know, that's the reason why the people are cautious. There's a lot of caution out there because not enough is known. And that's the bottom line. We are at the early stages, the gain of this. The scientific process, when it's working best, is slow, okay? To get tr a real understanding, to reduce the uncertainty that we are feeling, unfortunately, does take time. There's a lot of optimism about therapeutics. That may be the case. Um, Things could happen there. Hopefully that will. Uh, novel approaches to vaccine development like the messenger RNA approach could develop, give rapid um, results. How effective they will be, uh, they have to test that. Um, you could try it out. It's probably not that toxic. It's not known. Probably less toxic than a, um, other kinds of vaccines. But again, being a messenger RNA probably won't elicit the kind of responses that you'd get from the classical vaccines, which are either attenuated, which means a weakened form of the virus, so it still grows in the body. And you may remember, and you, you're lucky I'm not examining on this, but if I was, I'd say, what's the more important immune response you're probably going to get to coronaviruses? It's probably not the antibodies. It's probably the cell-mediated response. You probably need some kind of replication for this virus to elicit the more enhanced, the more profound, uh, not profound, but the more powerful response, which comes from cells actually being infected, and then those um, produce a much more vigorous, um, a much richer immune response than just uh, what you would get from uh, eliciting antibody responses. So that is all I wanted to say. Uh, um, a pity that technology didn't work, but maybe maybe not a pity. Maybe this is the way we have to do these virology studio talks. You know, they are not slick. My gosh, they are not slick. 
but um, I hope I hope it was of some value. Um, thank you for listening, for watching, and yes, let's keep talking. Stay safe. All the best to you.